Jonathan. How are you? Good. Jonathan, you can be the moderator. Would you like to be the moderator today? <laughs> oh, better remind me of the rules. Uh, we have till, Kim has till, um, how are you? It's an hour. Presentations are an hour. Okay. So till, 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 I guess, four, I guess, four. East Coast time. Yeah. Our time. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Cool. Good. Mm. All right. Good to see everyone. No, good. Armin's here. Hey, Armin. So we'll have like what Armin, uh, Joe, George. I suppose Shafat, it's like what, two in the morning or something for Shafat. So he's not here. Um, but yeah, okay, good. You guys will be answering questions in the chat. Uh, yep, I'll be here. Okay. So take another minute. I think we're okay. Yeah, everybody comes a bit late now, but I will get my my slides up at least. Okay, Kim, why don't you get started? Okay, great. So uh, thank you, Jonathan, and thanks for the organizers for putting this on the, uh, on the program. You guys have been doing a fantastic job this last year. I think everybody who's uh, attended should buy you guys uh, beers at some point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a joint work with uh, George, uh, um, Shafa, Armin, and uh, Joe. Joe, uh, George, and Armin are in the, uh, in the audience, and you can ask questions through the chat uh, if you'd like, otherwise you can just unmute yourself and, and jump in. So, um, there we go. So we, we've, we observe aggregate trade flows uh, and we sort of understand that those trade flows are functions of both individual firm choices, firms deciding uh, whether to export at all, how much to export, what prices to charge, uh, and then the distribution over those firms and how that distribution changes over time. And, how individual firms' choices change over time or what sort of shapes uh, aggregate trade flows, which is what we're often interested in. And uh, you know, these functions uh, or these choices are uh, functions of both past, present, and future policy. Uh, I tried to get George to let me uh, name this after a Christmas carol, but he wouldn't let me. So uh, that's where you have the title you have now. Uh, but you know, and so thinking about this, the, the kind of interplay between past and, and, and future policy you know, I think it's not uh, unfair to say there's a large literature that studies the effects of past policy. Every time we write down a model, lower tariffs in it, and solve for the new equilibrium, we're thinking about how, uh, uh, how the past policy changes have affected what we see today. There's been a kind of growing literature, kind of growing influential literature that focuses on uh, future policy and particularly the uncertainty over future policy. And I think uh, one of the, you know, some of the most influential uh, papers about this have been written kind of about this period of time here. So they had a 1990s and early 2000s and uh, the relate, trade relationship between China and the United States. So the black line there are China's imports into the United States and the blue line at the bottom are, uh, are tariff rates. And with the, those are median tariffs with the 25 and 75th percentile uh, range there. And you know, the story, which is a compelling one is that, uh, you know, uh, Tariffs themselves, observed tariffs don't change much over this period. But what was happening in the 90s was every time, every year, China had to have their uh, normal trade relations uh, status with the United States voted on by, uh, by Congress. And so it created uncertainty every year. In some sense, uncertainty was very easy to study because it had a regular, uh, had a, a periodicity to it. Uh, up until the US uh, grants uh, China permanent uh, normal trade relations in 2000, and then in 2001, China joins the WTO. And, what we see is that trade is growing for, you know, around this period, even though tariffs themselves don't really change. And the implication was that uh, the, the decrease of uncertainty that comes with uh, permanent normal trade relations uh, drove, uh, uh, drove an increase in people selling to the firms selling to the United States and, and trade volumes. 
So what we want to do then is just kind of go further back in time uh, and where, we, where there's just also a lot, of, a lot more going on. So if we kind of go back to 1974, uh, you know, pre-1971, there was a trade embargo between China and the United States. So one of the things that's going to be nice about thinking about China going all the way back to the, to the 70s is that we can really start a model in autarky and, and it kind of be doing something kind of close to what we think is going on in the data. And so there we see is we see, of course, in 1980, when China is granted their normal trade relations uh, access, tariffs fall uh, a lot and trade grows a lot. And in fact, trade's growing even before 1980, as you, know, you can imagine, the Chinese firms are adjusting to going from autarky to, to some kind of trade. And so there's just a lot of uh, trade growth going on here before we get to any of the uncertainty of trade in the 1990s and then the, the granting of PNTR access. So we want to use this, this episode, this period, the 1970s through about 2008, uh, to, to, to try to put together um, a kind of methodology for trying to disentangle the things that are coming from past trade uh, episodes, right? So the end of the embargo and, and the, the, the uh, NTR access in 1980 from the uncertainty that was going on in the 1990s and actually uncertainty could be going on throughout the entire period. So we're, the kind of big goal here is to come up with a methodology we can use anywhere for thinking about uh, trade flows and their relationships for past and future and future policies. And today we want to think about this through the, through the uh, kind of case study of China and the U.S. And as I mentioned before, one advantage is that we start in autarky, which is uh, helpful. Uh, and another advantage is that there is not a system of phase ins of the tariffs, for example, like we saw in, in something like NAFTA. So, you know, one of the issues, obviously, is that if there are perfectly foreseen, but, you know, uh, future phase-ins of tariffs, those are going to be harder, it's going to make it harder to identify uncertainty, for example, over potential future tariff changes. So the kind of stark change in, uh, in policy uh, is going to also kind of make our lives a, a little bit easier. So uh, this is a figure to kind of summarize exactly how trade policy was changing uh, over this relationship and over time. So what this figure is, is and it's here at the top, the definition is at the top. So that's the, uh, the NTR tariff rates that are common to all, you know, uh, more or less all NTR partners of the US and then divided by uh, the, the Chinese tariff rates. And so we think about the period of the embargo, we think about those tariffs basically being infinite. And so this, is, this line is zero up until 1971. So basically you're facing uh, you know, an infinite tariff and, and this is zero. Then as the embargo ends, now that jumps up to about uh, 0.8. So they've got about 80% of the market access uh, that the NTR countries have. And then in 1980, when they're granted NTR access, this basically goes to one. They now share the same uh, tariff rates with other NTR countries. And then down on the right-hand side, you can see a little blip downward again. Uh, that's, the, that's the trade wars. And then the dates are marked off here. Uh, so the embargo ends in 71. NTR axis uh, happens in 1980, the um, imposition of now a, a yearly vote in Congress as to whether China retains its NTR axis starts in 1990, then permanent access in the WTO in 2000, 2001. So, you know, what I'd like to take away from this picture is that there was really an enormous trade liberalization that happens in the 70s and uh, in the 70s, basically. And that, so it's maybe not surprising that there is this huge, uh, uh, huge liberalization and you would expect that that adjustment to that liberalization is gonna take a long time. And in fact, some of that adjustment is likely still going on in the 1990s, uh, while the uncertainty is happening and even you know, maybe into the 2000s. So we wanna to try to disentangle some of these things today, uh, both in a reduced form sense and in a structural, uh, structural model. Kim. Yeah, go ahead. Are you also going to measure the tariffs that, uh, or any type of barrier that China is imposing on imports? Obviously, the two are going to be interconnected. Yeah, so that uh, yeah, so that's a good point, point. Uh, and we're not going to do that. Uh, and I, I've got some some apologizing for it later on. But at the moment, we're taking all of this as just a uh, partial equilibrium exercise when we get to the quantitative model. Uh, so we're not taking into account Chinese relation Chinese um, uh, Chinese tariffs on U.S. goods, and we're also not taking into account any kind of uh, non-tariff barriers, which were certainly important at different points of this, uh, of this period. And so we still, have, uh, we still have a lot of work to do in that sense. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yep. So the plan uh, for today is I wanna start by just 
briefly summarizing the kind of sense of the slow nature of the adjustment, of the trade adjustment. We're going to do that by estimating something that I'm going to call a long and short run elasticity, but you'll see when we measure these things, I really just want to think about these things as, as you know, some kind of moments I'm, I'm computing from the data. I don't, we'll talk about exactly what the elasticities will be. Then we're going to um, revisit Pearson Schott and Hanley and Lemau and think about this difference in differences approach of uh, estimating the response to these tariff gaps. Um, and so we're going to take what they've done and, and work on work it over the entire sample. So we'll look at a much longer uh, series, uh, and then we'll try some kind of crude adjustments to, to kind of build in an effect of, uh, of, this past, uh, of this past policy. Now we're going to use the estimates from both step one and step two, those long and short run elasticities and the elasticities from the NNTR gaps as inputs into, the, into a structural model uh, that's going to have both an extensive and intensive margin, right? So I'll go back again to firms individual firm decisions over how much to sell and what prices to charge, and then decisions about whether to trade at all. And then we're going to have, you know, the model is going to have this kind of slow moving uh, adjustment of, uh, of firms. So we're going to try to have a model that can account for this gradual adjustment. And then we're going to include time varying uncertainty over the trade policy regime. Right? So we're going to kind of have both of those two forces in the model, and then try to use the model to recover uh, among other things, the beliefs that agents have over, uh, you know, over the uncertainty. So that's kind of the plan. So what are we going to find? We're going to find slow adjustment as just looking at that figure probably would have told you. And again, for now, I'm going to be a little bit loose and call these long run and short run elasticities. And we, you know, they, they differ by about a factor of three. So the short run elasticity is a lot smaller than the long run elasticity that kind of gradually builds over time. The NNTR gap coefficients, so the, the kind of measures of uh, how high, high, tar high potential tariff versus low potential tariff industries uh, respond, uh, we're going to find that these, these coefficients are much larger in the 70s than the 90s, that you know, the Chinese trade was a lot more um, depressed relative to the end of the period in the 70s than the 90s. Uh, and then, so we'll kind of talk through that and then show that when we include something that kind of is a meant to kind of capture lag trade policy, these gap coefficients shrink quite a bit, suggesting that a lot of what the gap coefficients were picking up were the effects of past policy rather than uh, un uncertainty over the future policy. Then in the model, we'll recover uh, a, a, a beliefs over, um, over trade policy uncertainty. Again, we're gonna find that uncertainty was much, much larger in the 80s and the 90s. We've got, you know, we've still got a lot of work to do here, but I think what we found so far is, uh, is particularly for the post 1980s, is uh, is pretty robust, uh, and that the that this is much larger than the uncertainty that we kind of see in and around uh, the year 2000. Um, and then we'll also just kind of be able to see that this the kind of high initial policy was also a, a policy uncertainty. So there's a lot of uncertainty when they're first granted NTR status. Basically, there's a lot of uncertainty over whether that's going to stick or not. Uh, that uncertainty further delays the transition, slows down the adjustment uh, from the earlier liberalizations. Okay, so that's the plan and that's sort of the overview of what we found. Then I'll just jump right into it. Okay, so let's start with these trade elasticities. Um, so the data are, we're gonna work with today are uh, SITC five digit categories in the kind of forthcoming working paper. Um, we go through and show that these these uh, a lot all of this is robust to trying to use more disaggregated data like HS8 and TSUSA8. Their issue there is that we've got to splice together uh, the two series, uh, and that can that can lead to some issues. But uh, everything I show you, we're going to look look at five digit goods, but with robust to using something more disaggregated. Um, uh, v is trade, trade value, tau is tariffs, and uh, delta are, are fixed effects. So we're going to look at some error correction models and the things to sort of, so this is a bit of a messy equation, but it's basically an error correction model where we're allowing for uh, the Chinese uh, elasticities to differ from the rest of the countries that aren't China. Okay. So the sample of countries in the baseline are all countries that had um, uh, NTR access over the period. So uh, this is going to recover then the short run elasticity kind of directly, and then the alpha parameters are going to, along with the short run elasticity, will give us the estimate for the long run elasticity. You do the same thing down here, just in growth rates rather than in, than in levels, but it's the same idea. Now, the caveat, of course, is that 
I'm not presenting these things as if we're estimating some kind of structural elasticities. These are ways to summarize in the data some differences between the short and the long run. And then we'll run these same regressions in our model. So the misspecification, any misspecifications that are out there, we'll be doing in the model and in the data. Uh, but as a way to kind of summarize the difference between the short and, and long run, the long run growth. So that's the Minnesota caveat before you show a uh, regression table. So uh, here are findings. Uh, they will start in the first column. So this is just like a pooled, a pooled cross section. So not taking into account any of the uh, dynamics of the data, uh, just uh, a regular uh, pooled cross section. And we find an elasticity here uh, of something close to seven. Oh, and I guess I should, man, I should, sorry, when we do this, I should say. So we're controlling for lots of things here with the fixed effects, right? So these are country time fixed effects, uh, country good fixed effects, and good time fixed effects. So we're taking care of, you know, changes in the demand for goods over time, changes in a country's comparative advantage over time, uh, changes in, co in country specific things that are, that are changing over time. So we're, we're washing out a lot of, uh, a lot of things uh, with this set of fixed effects. Okay, so the cross section without the dynamics shows a pretty high elasticity. Um, and then as we dig though a little bit deeper into uh, the dynamics, we find so that this is going to be the short run elasticity in the, in the levels regression, it's about 2.8. And the long run elasticity is now close to, uh, close to eight. So the cross section kind of gives you in some sense an average of those two uh, and, and kind of muddies the two into kind of one elasticity, which doesn't do a great job of describing exactly what, uh, what happened. We do this in, uh, in uh, growth rates, and this is kind of, kind of be our preferred specification that we then take to, uh, take to the structural model. Uh, we find a short run elasticity of about 2.3 and long run elasticity uh, of about eight, right? So whereas this kind of dynamic adjustment generates differences between uh, the kind of short and long run adjustment. And so that's gonna be our summary of the aggregate changes in trade. So we want our structural model to both replicate a short run elasticity and a long run elasticity uh, when, we, you know, when we liberalize trade in the model. So we're gonna take this right-hand column as being uh, something that we wanna make sure our model can account for, the aggregate dynamics of this stuff. Kim, Kim. sorry, just one question. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, yes, please. Um, so just to understand what would be in the era that would be confounding would be non-tariff barriers changing at the same time uh, in the same goods, right? And But yes. that doesn't really matter for you because here you want to pick up the total effect anyway of both the tariffs and the non-tariff barriers. Uh, yes, so we, uh, it, I, yeah, so that would be in the era term, uh, for example. Do we want to pick that up or not? Um, Quantitatively, I feel like you would probably want to, right? Because you so, to uh, yeah, certainly in, in this regression, it'd be interesting to pick that up because that's exactly telling us about some differential, how the differential trade barriers might be changing. In the model, it's going to say then that we're we're obviously going to load all of that onto uh, onto just the observed tariffs that we feed into the model. Um, so I'm not quite sure how to how we'd interpret it, but I think that's I think that's the right uh, the right issue though. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Was there another question? question? I'll ask another yes. question. Oh. oh, go ahead, Mike. No, I was gonna say, like in the time period, what like is there a sense in which you know the whole time period is driving this, or is it, you know, like if you th say you throw out the 70, 80, early 80 part and then ran the same regression, like do you get the same number or is it you, do you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, you're just well, let me go back to the actual data. You're saying so what we're picking up basically are the dynamics from 1974, 19, where 1974 roughly to 2008. Um, would we get a different answer if we started later? Um, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's hard to say, right? Because tariffs, suppose we started in 1990, tariffs do change a little bit, trade grows a bunch, um, but I don't know exactly how much that would change. My guess is that you know, this particular specification that we have, yeah, we would get different numbers because they said, we don't think we're, I don't think we're, uh, I don't, maybe George doesn't think this. I don't think we're picking up a sort of uh, parametric uh, elasticity. We'll, and when we go and estimates this stuff out of the model, we can even take a look and see that, for example, uh, our estimates of the short run are um, too are smaller. There's, a, there's a, like a downward bias there. Uh, and that's, you can see, you can see it for, even just from this picture, which is that when, uh, when tariffs fall, trade's already been growing for two or three years beforehand, presumably either uh, in anticipation of, of tariffs falling or as a result of uh, the end of the embargo. And so 
you know, as we change the window, we're going to get, we're, I'm, I'm almost certain we're going to get different answers, but um, maybe Armin uh, can talk about it a bit afterwards, but that's, that, that's probably correct. Um, I had two short questions, Kim. Please, what yeah, go is, ahead. Uh, just a clarification. J is just the rest of the world, that you're only looking at trade from China to the rest of the world. Correct? We are looking, sorry, no, sorry, yeah, let me be clear. J are countries exporting okay. to the United States. Other, so we've got oh. all the, so we've got all countries, yeah, sorry, I should, I, I probably go too fast. I, um, we're looking at all countries exporting to the United States who have uh, NTR uh, access over this period. I'll show you some robustness where we okay. include all countries, whether or not they have NTR access. And then I'm just breaking them up into two chunks, China and everybody else. So the everybody else coefficients, which um, I'm not it's reporting, but it would okay. be the, or is everybody else? That's right. So the comparison is China versus the rest of the countries. Sorry about when that. When exporting to the U.S. And then the other question is, what do you do with the zeros? Uh, good. So uh, again, so in this case, um, I, they're included in what I'm showing you. And then I'll show you robustness in a second to where we do balanced versus unbalanced panels. Yeah, that's a good question. Yep. So um, China is always on one side of this, right? China's always sorry, on one the US side. is always on one side. Yeah, the US is always the importer. That's right. So this isn't this isn't like a whole world uh, estimate. How are you identifying the JT uh, uh, off this? I, I'm just thinking China grows a lot in this period. So I mean, if you look at China's manufacturing, it would probably track that trade line pretty well. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's two. Yeah, so that's an, so, okay. So that's one of the issues is that China is growing over time. We're, we've been working on some estimates where we can kind of control for China supply factors a bit better. Those just aren't ready yet. The mm -hmm. other issue is that at the beginning of the sample, the U.S. is also a much bigger chunk of the world. And yeah, the U.S. is, is shrinking over time too. Um, and all I can say right now is that we're working on trying to come up with better ways to deal with those issues and we, we, don't, we don't have them yet, but those are, those are things to be, to be concerned about. Yeah. Uh, or we um, have stuff, but we're not really ready to show them yet. Uh, Kim, just kind of a clarification. So the alpha yep. is this seems to be the autocorrelation coefficient, right? So what you don't capture with the tau immediately, you attribute it to like slow adjustments. Is this the idea here? Uh, so that's right. This is, so yeah, so we've got, yeah, so there's no, in the um, in the levels uh, uh, error correction model, um, we pick up the autocorrelation. We're picking up the autocorrelation of, of trade, but not of uh, not of tariffs. In the second model down here, in the mm -hmm. kind of differences one, we allow uh, also directly for uh, past tariffs to show up. And so let's see. So those are those would be down here. So this, that's why this is going to be our, our sort of preferred specification. Um, where we do let both past uh, both past trade and past tariffs directly enter in, and then but this is all, only one period lag. Of how how do we think about these the are one just one? Versus... Why did we do one versus several? Um, is the assumption that you, everything adjusts after two periods or like? How, how no, do you think about it? no. So the no, no, it's it's not. Um, it's I guess the right way to do this would be to include more lags and. So now I'm gonna now I'm gonna say how, that uh, I don't know exactly how we ended up on one, um, but the right thing to do would be to, to do several lags and wait and find the ones that are significant. Um, this is one. This is sort of the simplest version uh, of what we're doing. Okay. Yeah. Maybe so, think about more lags. Yeah. So Kim, going back to that, the equations you were showing us, the identification is off the cross good variation in the tariffs. Right. That's right. Yeah. So th this is. Um, uh, if I took see, the G, G out of there, I'd have a JT and a JT. That's right. JT. And they would all be soaked up. Yep. Yeah. That would get soaked up by the air term. That's right. So the G is what's providing the action here. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Because otherwise the JT fixed effects would, would just uh, suck all these up. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so that's sort of our a way to think about the the aggregate changes uh, in trade here. So now we're going to move on to uh, thinking about now this the kind of differences between goods uh, that had large differences uh, in their um, uh, MFN rate and their non MFN rate. So this is 
uh, following the language of Pearson Schott and others, they call these things the NNTR gaps, right? So the difference between the, the rate that I'm getting under MFN and what the rate I would get if I somehow lost MFN status. And they think about that as a measure of sort of how, uh, how much uncertainty there is or how painful, I guess, you know, the uncertainty would be over uh, if you were to lose your MFN status. And so we're going to basically take this more or less right from what they're doing. We're going to extend the, uh, we're going to start by just extending the sample out, uh, out longer. So this is, um, again, the fixed effects. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the observed tariff. And then this thing here, this first thing is um, a, a indicator function for before and after the year 2000. So that was you know, when presumably all the uncertainty went away over the, NNT, over the NTR. And then again, picking off China versus all the other countries. And so here's a, uh, some, some estimates of these things. So the first column is, is are just the Pearson shot uh, using their, uh, their sample. So it was 92 to 07, they were looking at uh, all the, and then all the countries. And um, we're using a different, dis we're using again, a five digit disaggregation rather than they used a more disaggregate one. So our number's a little bit higher, but this is, but this is what their regression uh, would have shown. And so then they, you know, they interpret that 0.9 as saying that's the, um, that's the, uh, the, the high versus low uh, tariff gap um, uh, elasticity. And I'll show you some, some more of these in a minute. Uh, and then these are a bunch of robustness, some of which I've alluded to. So the, the first thing is our, now these are our estimates. So this is we, uh, basically all we do moving from Pearson shot to, to this is to um, now extend the sample period to go all the way back to 1974. So we're incorporating now more data and particularly data from, uh, uh, from where these big liberalizations took place. And you see these gap coefficients get a lot bigger, right? like um, uh, almost a factor of two and a half, a little more than a factor of two and a half. And so that's kind of our sort of baseline kind of number, which is that basically this stuff mattered a lot more uh, the further back you go, uh, you go in time. And I'll, I'll show you some visualizations of these numbers in a minute. And then these things on the right are kind of some different robustness checks. Um, so this was, if we, now if we include only the NTR countries, um, this is if we exclude tariffs, there's a, there's a bit of an issue here, which is that the, the gap coefficient is you know, uh, the column two tariff, that the, high, you know, the high tariff uh, and minus the MFN tariff. And so if the, the tariffs are the MFN tariff, so those are gonna be correlated with, uh, with the gap coefficient, particularly early on in the sample. And so uh, our, our early on in sample, uh, our sort of preferred method would be not to include those. It just weakens the coefficient, the, the sort of classic uh, uh, you know, regression problem. So if we exclude tariffs, these things go up a little bit more. And then these last two are just different measures of, uh, of, of exposure. So the, um, we're using applied uh, NNTR, uh, we're using applied, sorry, applied tariffs. Uh, and then um, the, this are just the statutory, statutory tariffs by themselves, not as a gap. Uh, and then the applied tariffs again, but not as a gap. So just a, just a, rather than the gap, just the, uh, just the um, tariffs themselves. So uh, the, you know, the sort of takeaway from this is these numbers get a lot bigger, but I think the, it's more interesting uh, to take a look then to allow these coefficients to vary by time. So uh, this is the same regression as above, but now we're just gonna estimate a coefficient for each year, right? And it looks like this. So. Yeah, this is again, 92 to 2000 or so. This is kind of the period that people have looked at a lot. And I would say that, you know, this is the, you can think about it as, you know, um, the end of the sample, this thing basically has to be zero. So as we read to the left, this is kind of how much trade was depressed by, uh, you know, by, uh, by these uh, uh, factors. And as we go even further down, you see these things get, get much bigger, um, part, you know, reflecting the fact that trade's grown a lot more. Uh, and now these, uh, these coefficients, right, again, tied up in these coefficients are both the lagged effects of past policy, so kind of the initial conditions of, uh, uh, of the country, uh, as well as expectations into the future. Right? And so we see that these are pretty flat, uh, you know, very negative and flat before 1980. There's a jump here uh, with that kind of NTR liberalization, and then it kind of stalls out for a bit and then continues to grow. So 1986 is when uh, China um, petitions to join or, or to rejoin, I guess. China was one of the initial signatories uh, of the gap. Um, then we see that the 1990s, 
that this is actually a fairly small part uh, of the growth that's happened since, uh, since, since the end of the embargo. Um, let's see, other things to be said about this. Um, no, I think that's what I want to say. So I'll open up for a pause for a moment in case people want to ask questions. Hey, Matt, I had a, a question on this. Do, doesn't this yeah. imply that there would be kind of some massive pre-trend effects in the Pearson shot analysis? I can't remember if they, they showed that, but it, it seemed like this is what this would imply, no? Yeah, so that, I mean, so exactly. And that's part of what we're trying to dig into and, and sort out is that, you know, the question, I guess, you know, the question would be, you know, are we, did we somehow get to a steady state in the early 1990s and we're starting from there? Or is this all growth from, uh, from the initial liberalizations? Uh, and so, yes, that's potentially uh, a, an issue with just looking at the shorter period is uh, exactly what the pre-trends uh, look like. And that's, again, part of what we're going to try to sort out. We try to disentangle uh, with, the, with the structural model. But that, that, that's right. This is kind of what we're hoping to undo at some point is to, is to get rid of, uh, in a structural way, to, to kind of take out the effects of this past policy that's probably contaminating uh, the expectational measures. Yeah. Hey, the, and and um, Kim, just to, just to help you out with uh, China in, uh, in the GATT, the GATT's from 1947. The government, yeah. uh, the government of uh, uh, China at that time was the Kuomintang government. And, uh, and the U.S. Rec recognized them as the government of China for a long time. That's Taiwan now. Uh, I, okay, that's correct. Yep. Thank you. Yes, that's right. So then when the People's Republic of China didn't be, it was never in until 2001. Okay. Yeah, okay. No big deal. I mean, just tell. No, hey, look, I'm not an economic historian. I appreciate your help. China claims they're the same country. Thank PRC. You. I don't Thank know if we want to get into this over Zoom, guy. We might get in trouble. We might get banned think, from Zoom. Speaking of economic history, I think when you talk about policy, you're talking about policy from a, a WTO or a government or an agency perspective. Yeah, what certainly. I think about, I'm wondering if your model also includes um, policy as set by companies. So that, for instance, during the early 1990s, there was a major change of policy by one of the biggest consumer retailers in America when Walmart no longer sold only goods made in America, but started sending over purchasing agents around 1992 into China to start sourcing from there. And I wonder if that will show up in, in your models here. Okay, uh, so that's actually that's, in, uh, that's actually interesting. Um, there's been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of work on kind of Walmart's uh, influence on suppliers, but uh, we haven't thought about it in this context. Uh, to the extent that it shows up as an increase in demand from uh, uh, from uh, the United States for uh, particular goods, um, the fixed effects will pick up some of that stuff. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's a, that it would be interesting to think about whether a company that big, uh, would show, you know, you know, would show up in these aggregate numbers. It probably would. Okay. So the last thing I want to do with this, uh, reduced form stuff is I'm going to do the same regression we ran before, but I'm just going to add flag trade values. Okay. And so this is just sort of a simple way to try to think about, uh, including, uh, the effects of past policy, the effects of, uh, 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 of the, this kind of slow adjustment into, uh, into these estimates. Otherwise, everything's going to stay the same. And we end up with pictures that look like this. So the, the, the black line is one I just showed you, and the blue line is once we control for, for past trade volumes. Uh, and you know, the, the takeaway, of course, is that this thing shifts up quite a bit, suggesting, but not sort of not proving, or, or but suggesting that you know, the, this kind of slow adjustment, the effects of what was going on you know, initially uh, are probably wrapped up quite a bit in, uh, in, these, uh, in these estimates. And in fact, by the time we get out here now to the 1990s, you know, these two, the, the uh, confidence intervals are now even starting to, starting to overlap. And you see that a lot of, uh, a lot of this is, has sort of gone away. Uh, this is fairly flat, in fact, by the time we get into the 90s. So this suggests that the, the past policy is potentially 
uh, is potentially something interesting to think about. And that's what we want to try to now use a, the structural model uh, to, try to, to try to understand. Okay, so uh, yeah, there's a bunch of robustness things that we do um, that I'm not going to talk about. I don't even have slides for, but uh, I see Cecilia talked about balance and unbalanced panels. Uh, thinking about shipping costs, life cycle control. So this also goes back to somebody's question, uh, uh, yeah, about uh, about samples. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, George and his co-authors have been have been thinking about is that um, thinking about how long a good has been traded. I guess this is stuff Tim and I have thought about too. How long a good has been traded uh, I, kind of shows up as significant in these things. Thinking about the fact that it might take time to build up a, a sort of shipping an expertise in selling certain kinds of goods different samples of countries and levels of aggregation. So it's, this stuff is fairly robust, but we still have a lot of, a lot of work to do. Okay, so the, the model. So the, the goal of the model is to try to help us disentangle, as I've said before, the future uncertainty over policy versus the effects of, of policy that's happened in the past. So we kind of are gonna have two, uh, two sort of main ingredients that we need to help us do that. So the first is obviously some time varying uncertainty over policy. So I'll talk more about exactly how we're gonna introduce that. And the second is we need some form of a slow adjustment. We, we, we need a model where you liberalize trade and it takes some time for, uh, for trade to grow. We're gonna model this uh, following stuff that George has been doing for, uh, for a while and, and, and me too, as the fact that it takes firms time to kind of build up their, uh, their expertise and, and their, their productivity in, in, in exporting. So that's, there are other ways to, uh, to generate adjustment. You could do, uh, accumulating customers or demand like uh, Durian has worked on or uh, draws the nozzle. Um, but so this is just a, a version of, uh, of how to get some, some slow adjustment. And it's, it's the one we already had kind of on our computer. So um, that's what we're going with. This is basically a partial equilibrium, equilibrium version of, uh, of the uh, Alessandria, Choi and uh, Rule paper. So we're gonna have uh, you know, capital G goods, which are going to be the SIT five digit goods that we had in the data. So we're gonna have a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of goods, which you think about as industries or, or whatever we're gonna call them goods. And then within each good, there's a mass of producers, a continuum of producers who are kind of heterogeneous in productivity and have variable trade costs. So kind of this, the, the uh, Mellet's version with um, some kind of time to accumulate uh, uh, export and capital. So that's gonna be, uh, here and the variable trade cost that's going to change over time within a firm in an idiosyncratic way. And I'll talk more about that. Here, oops, here's the productivity. And then this version of the model, um, firms exit um, firms exit exporting or enter exporting endogenously, but a firm actually dying off, uh, ceasing to exist is going to be uh, going to be exogenous in this version of the model. So a firm will die and they'll be replaced by a new firm. And we're going to let the probability um, the probability that you exit is going to be increasing in your productivity. So low productivity firms are going to be more likely to exit. High productivity firms are going to be less likely to exit. So we're capturing some of the dynamics you would have gotten uh, with uh, an endogenous exit decision. But to simplify things for right now, at least, uh, that's just going to be exogenous. And then the model is going to have two policy regimes. I'll call them the NNTR regime and the MFN regime. So, uh, And then at each time T, there's going to be a probability that probability can move around over time of going back and of moving to the other regime. So it's a Markov process uh, where the probabilities can change uh, at, at different points in time. So producers in China, this is going to look very familiar. Um, they produce uh, using, you know, using labor, which isn't terribly important for what we're doing today. The demand, a firm's demand is going to depend on, so these are imagine they're CES, basically consumers in, uh, in the United States. The demand for a particular firm's good is going to depend on its price, on the tariff, the U.S. tariff that it faces. And then this is, think about this as an iceberg trade cost, although it could stand in for, uh, for other types of uh, mechanisms. This is an iceberg trade cost. This is, the tr this is an elasticity. This is the parametric elasticity. Right? So this is, yeah, as I said before, this is, this is an elasticity. This is not what we think we've recovered when we ran the regressions earlier. We'll, we'll be able to look at the difference between those and say something about uh, about some of the bias that's there. And then this is just an aggregate demand term that gets, you know, that, that will, in the regressions was getting sucked up by, uh, by the fixed effects. So, uh, so then demand depends, of course, on tariffs, and then it depends on these uh, export costs. So for those of you who have sat through enough of 
my talks, um, this is a process. So a firm, when they're not an exporter, faces an infinite cost of, of shipping. So they can't get anything across the ocean. When they pay a, a cost to become an exporter, they'll start off as a high cost um, exporter. So they can ship, but it's expensive to do so. And then in each period, the firm, I think this is a Markov process over, over these costs, the firm draws a realization and can move to a, a lower cost or can move back to a higher cost. And so there's a Markov process over how, how good I am as, a, as, a, as an exporter. And the idea here is that the longer a firm stays in the market, the more likely it is to become a low exporter, the, you know, a low cost exporter, low cost exporters get big and, and export more. Uh, so that's kind of generating a, internally within a firm, a kind of slow adjustment, a kind of slow growth into, into exporting. And that's going to be one of the things that get, helps us get uh, a, a slow adjustment process. There's some fixed costs uh, to export, the usual kind of there's one to enter and uh, one to continue. And then just as a, a way to write down the model, there's a one period time to export. So I pay the cost today to, uh, to export tomorrow. Static uh, optimization is straightforward. Firms are monopolistic competitors. Firm comes into the uh, comes into the period already knowing whether it's an exporter or not. chooses its it chooses its uh, prices, and this is you know just a standard constant markup over over marginal cost. So this is there's nothing kind of interesting here. Uh, okay, nothing interesting here except note that here is this cost of uh, of trading, and it has a T on it and can move around, so you can become a, a better or worse. Uh, exporter. So this is kind of the, um, the dynamic choices. So we can define the value of a firm uh, who chooses. So this is a, a, the value of a firm uh, who's choosing. So the one says, I'm choosing to become an exporter in the next period, who uses good G. Right? And so their individual states are um, the productivity of the firm, the, uh, the shipping cost the firm faces uh, uh, today, and then the, the trade, uh, the tariffs that it faces. So it's choosing to be an exporter in the next period. I'm gonna stop doing that. It's choosing to be an exporter in the next period. So it's paying its fixed cost, which depends on whether it's shipped in the past or not. Probability of, uh, of uh, sticking around to the next period. We're discounting right now. Here we're discounting at just a constant discount rate. Um, we've actually been doing experiments with different discount rates, it turns out not to be very important, even though you think that it might, at least in the partial equilibrium world, it turns out not to be, uh, not to be very important for what we're doing. So that's just a constant. And then uh, the value in the, in the next period. So that's going to require an expectation over the productivity of the firm, the shipping technology of the firm, and then what the tariff is tomorrow. So that's, you know, that's where the, uh, the tariff uncertainty is going to come in. I notice that that expectation, in fact, sort of the value functions have, you know, have time subscripts. This isn't stationary. Uh, and neither are expectations because the, uh, the tariff process is, is allowed to change over, over time. A firm that doesn't export, doesn't pay any costs, uh, and then starts the next period as a non-exporter, so with, a, with, an infinite, uh, with an infinite iceberg cost. So it doesn't get to, to ship in the future. And then the firm's value is just you know, they sell, given whether they were an exporter or not this period, they, they earn uh, today's profits and they make a choice over whether to be an exporter tomorrow or not. So then this generates as usual, uh, mar a marginal firm type. Um, and the marginal firm type is one that you know, equates uh, V1 and V0. And so for each value of, uh, uh, of C, of the trade costs, There'll be marginal. Uh, there'll be a marginal product productivity type, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a pair. These things are defined by the pair, and this is kind of the typical sort of equation uh, that I think is nice for looking at and thinking about, you know, kind of past and future policy is is, is kind of tied up here. So this is, you know, when I set these equal to each other and and uh, and uh, substitute in the the definitions, well, the left hand side that's the cost of exporting of, be, of being an exporter next period. And that could be because I'm retaining my export status, or it could be uh, because I, I'm, I'm joining as an exporter. So the fact these could be different Fs are going to imply you're going to get you know different cutoffs. And then, well, this is just the discounted value of well the entire future path of me being either an exporter the first term or not being an exporter in the second term. And so you can see here, obviously, here are the paths of tariffs showing up. So the uncertainty over uh, that both the both the, the path of tariffs and the uncertainty over the path of tariffs 
uh, are, are showing up here. So that's where future policy is dictating or is, is influencing how firms choose to enter, you know, to continue as an exporter or to enter the export market or to leave the export market. Okay? And then the effects of the past policy are wrapped up in things like which fixed cost I'm paying. So if there was a liberalization in the past that pushed me into the export market, I'm paying lower costs in order to, uh, in order to continue in the export market. Uh, and then also in the type of shipping technology that I use. So past liberalization, I'm already exporting. If I've been exporting for a while, my, my, my technology will be better. So this is kind of the, the confluence of the, the future and the past sort of together, and then influencing that kind of extensive margin uh, decision. So whether or not I should be, uh, I should be exporting. And then the the trade technology is then going to further export is going to further um, influence how much I sell today, right? So that influences the price I charge today and how much of it I get to ship today. So both the intensive and extensive margin here are shaped by uh, by past and future future policy. Okay, and I guess you know this is maybe just say it's just one more time, but uh, yeah, okay, I don't know. This is this is then going to be aggregate exports in our model. So I started off by saying, you know, aggregate trade comes from individual firm choices. So prices and quantities here. And then it comes from how many of these firms are doing what. So this is the, you know, the distribution of exporting firms of good G, uh, you know, how many of them we have. And so the P times Y that the current trade, right, that's going to jump when there's a trade liberalization, right? The tariffs fall and, and you know, and revenues rise. Uh, so that's, a, that's kind of... Uh, the immediate kind of variables. And then, you know, this, uh, this uh, measure over firm types, that's the kind of slow moving state variable uh, that's, gonna, uh, that's gonna add to uh, some of this adjustment over time. Okay, so that's the model. It's, it's pretty standard, um, well, at least standard to me at this point. Uh, but then this is kind of where the things are, are, are kind of a little more non-standard. So we're gonna start the model off in 1971. So that's right after the embargo ends. Um, and so we know then, or we're going to assume then that all firms are non-exporters because they were embargoed the period before that. Then, so beginning in 1971 in the benchmark model where we're going to include this trade policy uncertainty. In 1971, all the firms wake up, they learn autarky is over, they're allowed to trade, and they're in the, um, the, uh, the, non, the, the NNTR, uh, the non-normal trade regime. And then they learn about two paths of tariffs the NNR tariffs and the MFN tariffs. So the NNTR tariffs are, are fixed, but MFN tariffs do change over time. And so in 1971, the assumption is firms can see that path of tariffs. So they see the two paths of tariffs, and then they observe a time varying Markov process uh, of switching between the NNTR and the MFN. So I know what the potential tariffs are, and I know what the probabilities are uh, that I'm gonna face at every point in time. So that's gonna be our first model of, uh, of, uh, of timing and beliefs of this, okay? Okay, so there's not really anything very interesting here, I think, let's see. Just one clarification. Yeah, please, go ahead. So th this uh, tariff process is the idea that I see a probability that it switches. So, you know, in every period it's, you know, I'm in one, I, let's say I'm in, I'm in state one, there's a probability of getting to state two. And then if in, I'm in state two, there's a probability of getting to state one. And That's that, right. That matrix is constant over time. No, that matrix is going to change over time okay. to, to, to incorporate the uncertainty. And that's going to be one of the main things we have to estimate. So those are one of the things we're doing is we're going to then fit that set of probabilities so that we can hit moments in the data. That's right. But, but at, a, at a given point in time, I'm taking expectations over the infinite future. Um, yes. I, 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 my belief right now is that I've got these, these let's say, uh, uh, I can characterize it by a pi one and a pi two. That's um, right. These switching probabilities. Now, yep. do I have beliefs about my beliefs or my belief at a given point in time is that it's, this matrix is gonna remain fixed forever? So in, in this first example that I'm showing you right now, I observed the entire path of the pi ones and pi twos in 1971. Okay, so I fully, so. I fully anticipate what my beliefs are gonna be, how my beliefs are gonna change over time. That's right. And then I'll show you an experiment where people are surprised all the time okay. as well. And then we'll also so, show you the perfect foresight one. Okay. Okay. So I expected something a little bit different. Okay. Given, given some of the stuff that um, you and I and, uh, and Joe had done. 
Okay. So, so this has, I mean, you have a probability that you'll get an MFN for a few years and then you'll go back to NNTR. And That's right. The probability of getting, so it's not like that just one dimensional thing like that you had in your uh, Brexit paper, Joe. This is the full curse of un, uh, dimensionality. I'm I'll let I'll let Joe answer that because it's his Brexit paper. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, Tim, that's that's right. We we've actually done this that way as well, where there's a once you get MFN, or sorry, once you get in get kicked out of MFN back to NNTR, then the, the gig is up and you're in N NNTR forever. Right. Um, you know, we think, especially in light of what's happened recently, that that's probably not the best way to think about the world. Uh, right. But we have done it that way. And you know, but, we, but we once you are thinking ones. about anyway, this is general discussion. Once you are thinking okay. about general equilibrium, Joe, when you know this, it's so much uh, easier to do it that way. Doing the full yeah. nonlinear general equilibrium at every node is just really complicated with the curse of our, our dimensionality. Yeah, we can't absolutely. solve this model in GE. We've already got, a, you know, 2,000 sectors. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, so you're not doing general equilibrium at any point. All right. <laughs> that Toronto has changed your brain or something. Okay. So, uh, so we've got some timing and beliefs. Uh, uh, the, <laughs> the estimates. So the these are fairly standard things that we're, that we're meeting here. Here's the kind of important part of the calibration. So as I mentioned before, we're gonna kind of take a, a direct inference approach. So those uh, difference to difference regressions with the different coefficients on, uh, on tariff gaps and on those error correction models that we showed you at the beginning, those are, those are gonna be moments that we wanna match. So we're gonna solve the model and run it forward. And then we're gonna run those exact same regressions in the model like we did in the data. We even have the same number of sectors. Yeah, so, there's, so we're kind of doing the exact same thing. And we're going to then choose some parameters so that we match our regression coefficients, match the regression coefficients in the data. That's sort of the, the big thing we're trying to do. And we're doing that. So again, think about the error correction model stuff about matching aggregate trade adjustment and the difference in different stuff about trying to match the industry differences, how they, how they respond. So the things that we have to recover uh, and Dorian sort of uh, mentioned this, and maybe I should have just said it earlier. So yeah, you can think about there being, for the probability of going between NNTR and MFN, you can think about there as basically being two coefficients or two parameters. I'm gonna call them omega two one. So that's going from column two tariffs to column one tariffs. And then omega one two, which is going from column one tariffs to column two tariffs, where column two tariffs are the NNTR and column one are the, uh, are the MFN tariffs. So we're in, now we're gonna start making some we're gonna start making some assumptions here. Again, these are things we, we might be able to relax later. We're gonna think that the probability of going from NNTR to MFN is constant. So I'm gonna drop the T on this. So that's that's one parameter, and we're gonna use that to match the average of the gap coefficients from the difference in difference regressions from 1974 to 1999. So if before you get MFN status, uh, we're gonna kind of choose omega and let that be constant to match that. We can, we can talk about maybe ways we might be able to identify it, a time-varying one, but we don't, we don't have that yet. And then we're gonna choose uh, an omega, the, the probability of going from MFN to NNTR, we're gonna choose those to, to vary from 1980 to 2008 to match those gap coefficients from 1980 to 2008. So that's in some ways, in some naive way, that's you know, a set of, uh, of uh, unknowns and, and, uh, um, and equations, but it's certainly not uh, independent. Then the demand elasticity, theta, we're gonna set that to match uh, the short run elasticity from the ECM. And here you can see we're recovering a short run elasticity of 2.3, but the kind of parametric elasticity is 3.55, right? So that's some sense in which the ECMs are, are uh, I guess, misspecified if you think that the short run should be recovering the parametric theta, uh, but it's getting kind of washed up in, into this stuff. And then the iceberg persistence cost, so this is, the persistence in staying either a good or a bad exporter, having the good versus bad export technology, that gives us the long run elasticity more or less. Um, and so we set that, so it's fairly persistent, 0.85, uh, to match a long run elasticity of eight, which we had in the, in the regressions. Kim, the theta is the CES elasticity? That's right, yeah. yeah so the gap between 
this sigma in the theta includes, for instance, all the fixed costs and that sort of the entry decision. Yeah, the fixed costs. Um, we've, yeah, and so we've done, so I don't want to, this, I don't want to get into a lot because I don't think George uh, wants me to. We're working on some stuff trying to come up with what under what conditions the ECM uh, regressions come close to recovering kind of the true parameters, if you will. And um, when uh, one of the biggest problems is like anticipation effects. So if you're anticipating uh, a, a liberalization in a dynamic model like this, those, but a once and for all surprise uh, um, liberalization, these things tend to pick, to pick them up, but otherwise, yeah, extensive margin stuff, anticipation effects are all going to kind of create problems for us here. Further, if we had uh, phase-ins, if we had tariff phase-ins, like in NAFTA, that would give us even more grief. So China, in some sense, this is one of our, this is maybe one of the, the closest we're getting to that kind of platonic ideal of everybody's surprised by a tariff change and it happens all at once. Kim, I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, so um, the, wouldn't you in the future endogenize the probability from switching from one regime to the next? And then the other thing is that, um, why would you do, oh, sure, of course you can do the calibration, but uh, would you be thinking in using this uh, regime switching model by Hamilton to be able to get the estimates and uh, how we switch from one regime to the other and the probabilities as well? So um, a regime switching model in the sense of in the, in the, I mean, this is more or less a regime switching model. That's not quite, I don't want to say that. Yes, we've thought about regime switching models. Um, and yes, maybe some, maybe we will uh, go, you know, return to those at some point. Um, endogenizing the probabilities. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, yes, you might think that the more important the trade relationship gets, the less likely you are to revert to NNTR. I mean, the trade wars are pretty small compared to what we've seen in the past, but for right now, this is kind of, uh, yeah, this is kind of the best we can do, I think. Okay, so I just have, yeah, a few minutes left. So let me show you some results. So the, first of all, the black line, uh, those are the difference in difference coefficients from, the, from earlier in the talk. Those are literally just straight from the figures I showed you earlier. Uh, we're going to post 1980 smooth that line out a little bit so the model converges better. Uh, but notice that we're um, we're still capturing this kind of lull, and then the 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 uh, the increase is coming after that. What we're really doing is kind of helping ourselves uh, not having to kind of mess around to try to hit those those couple of points. What we're not smoothing, and this is important, is we're not smoothing the jump here. Right, this is the jump that occurs as the NNTR uh, goes into effect. Uh, as the NTR, sorry, goes into effect. And that's because that's an important part for helping us identify the short run elasticity. Because in the model, that jump right, is, all in, is all intensive margin, right? There's a time to build, you know, the firms aren't, there's not a big extensive margin in, uh, as you go from 1979, uh, 1980, 1981. And so uh, that's gonna be kind of helpful for the short, the short run estimation. And so we're, we're kind of not gonna smooth that. So we're making our lives a little harder there, but, and then the smoothing is just, just to kind of make it easier. So here's the model fit. So remember, we're, we're choosing um, the two, we're choosing the elasticity, and but more important, we're choosing those uh, probabilities of, of regimes in order to hit these coefficients. And so the, the benchmark model coefficient, so we run the same regressions in the data as in the model. Uh, and then you can see this is kind of our fit. So we fit the model uh, pretty well, uh, given kind of how much stuff is going on here. Uh, again, we're getting that, importantly, we're kind of getting this jump right, and then we're kind of basically tracing these things out and they're, they're pretty close. So this is maybe punchline number one. So these are those estimated probabilities uh, out of the benchmark model. So first they look at the dashed line. That's a probability of going to, going from the uh, NNTR to MFN. So that's the probability of getting into, uh, of getting into the, the uh, MFN tariffs. We estimated those to be constant, uh, you know, that was an assumption that they're constant. And then the level was set to basically capture this, this period here, try to get these coefficients. So we're kind of minimizing the, uh, the distance between those two. Then the, the solid line, those are the probabilities that you're in the MFN, but you might revert to the NNTR, right? This is the, these were the, these are the probabilities that, you know, Handley and Lima, Pierce and Schott have talked about is the part that's generating 
uh, the hesitation by firms. And so when you remove this stuff, trade grows. Um, so let's ignore for a moment pre-1980. So you see there's a lot of uncertainty here. Right? So there's like 75% chances of reverting to the, uh, to the NNTR at the beginning. There's a big decline in the probabilities through the 80s. And at, by the time we get to the 90s, you know, things, are, um, things are, are, are starting to flatten out a bit. Um, George doesn't like it when I point to any particular thing, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm giving the talk. There is a bit of an increase in our estimates. Now, there's standard errors around these that we haven't computed yet. There's their uh, robustness that we can do, but there is some, some kind of a, a bit of an uptick here and, and then a, a, a decrease uh, as well. But certainly, I, I think that the fact there was an enormous amount of uncertainty uh, kind of at, at, at the beginning. Uh, the pre-1980 stuff, again, this is a question of how do you identify these things? Uh, since, these, since the firms were in the NNTR uh, uh, regime at this point, we just set this to be constant at whatever the 1980 point is, because this is something like if somehow you magically ended up in the MFN, what would be the, the probability of going back? So, that's, so that thing's not, um, not really identified, but this is the hump. Okay. Kim? Yes, this, please. Um, the 70% event never happened, right? <laughs> That's right. None of these events happen. And uh, so like, if I say that it's only a, it seems like the fact that we stayed in the 30% probability for like seven years in a row implies a very tiny number. So should I be surprised by this high probability event never arising from like 82 <laughs> to 89 or whatever? Um, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I agree. It's a high probability event that doesn't occur for, for many periods. Um, I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what margins of the model to change uh, to sort of do that. I mean, mechanically, you can see what has to, uh, it looks like it's a high probability because we get the, the jump in trade and then things kind of stall, right? And so that's kind of mechanically where that's coming from. You know, the idea would then be what else might've been going on during this period that we haven't included in the model that would have caused that kind of lull. And right now we're loading it onto kind of the idea that, um, uh, that there were just high probabilities of, uh, of of going back to the NNTR, but without uh, without ever happening. Yeah. Um, now, on the other hand, another way to look at it, uh, John, is um, here's the present value of tariffs. So this is just the usual kind of. I take the estimated probabilities. We know what the tariff series are, and we can compute. So the black line are the you know the observed tariffs, and then the red line are the um, or the present value. So that at every point in time that's changing as probabilities change and you know, as we move through time. Uh, and so you can see that the present value of tariffs stays high for quite a while. And that's what's keeping right, entry out. Right? So that's what's kind of slowing these things down. And then again, these things fall as, uh, uh, as probabilities fall and, it's, and you know, these tariffs change a little bit, but not much. This is mostly kind of probabilities here. Okay, so I, I should wrap up soon. So let me just kind of talk about two more counterfactuals and then be done. So the second counterfactual, or the first counterfactual model is a no, no trade policy uh, uncertainty. So again, everybody wakes up in 1971, autarky is over. We're in the NNTR regime, but we learn that with, with perfect foresight, with no uncertainty, we're going to be in NNTR until 1980 and MSN forever after that. So no uncertainty, you know, exactly what's going to happen in the future. So here, uh, we're no longer trying to est we're no longer trying to fit these coefficients because we no longer have the the uh, omegas as, as as variables. Those are now just these are all perfect foresight. And so here you can see the difference between the the two lines. In some sense, is telling us what uh, uncertainty, um, what trade policy uncertainty did to uh, to, to aggregate to, to affect uh, trade flows, right? And so it's much larger in the 1980s. That difference is very big, and by the time we get to the 90s, that gap has shrunk a bunch because a lot of the uh, the uncertainty has gone away. It's still there, right? So there is still uncertainty that's uh, that that's keeping trade uh, depressed over this period. Uh, but there's there's just kind of a lot more. Uh, there's a lot more kind of repression of the trade here. Um, also, since you know firms know in advance that uh, the trade. Um, your trade policy, or the, the trade liberalization is coming, they forego entering, right? So the, the trade is more repressed in the early period because everybody's just waiting to jump in when, uh, when, uh, um, when tariffs fall. Whereas over this period, there's a probability that tariffs might fall earlier. Uh, and so uh, some people have already entered at that point. Here's the present value of tariffs. In this case, 
you know, they're lower, they fall fast, uh, and, and then are basically flat. Okay, last thing, and then I'll stop. Um, the last thing is something uh, I'm gonna call it like the surprises model. So this is thinking a little bit about alternative uh, beliefs. Uh, so in this case, again, you wake up in 1971, you learn that autarky is over, you're in the NNTR regime. Here, again, there's still gonna be a time varying um, uh, transition matrix. But in every period, you think it's going to be that matrix for forever. So you, you know, in 1972, you observe the transition probabilities for 72 to uh, 73, but you think those are also going to be the transition probabilities for forever. So I'm every morning I wake up and I'm surprised by a new uh, by a new uh, Markov matrix. Now we estimate that to fit again to fit this thing. We do pretty good. And then, so here's the differences in, uh, in probabilities. So again, let's start with the post-1980 stuff. Uh, again, high probability of uh, reversion at the beginning, a very similar kind of shape uh, as before. And then you know, by the time we get into the 90s, these things are, are, are very similar. Um, uh, you know, here you have this very high probability in 1980s. So that's probably the biggest difference. And you know, again, that's an, again, that's sort of an, I don't know if I want to say an artifact, but that's because since people know these things are permanent, you know, if people believe that uh, uh, that what was going to was going to happen forever, then I've got to have a pretty high uh, a pretty high probability that I'm that we're going to uh, stay. Uh, I'm sorry that we're going to be an NNTR in order to keep trade uh, kind of low in the pre 1980 uh, the pre So I would just sort of say in general, and I hope I I hope I don't say anything that George doesn't like uh, the pre 1980 stuff is hard to identify. You know, it's the stuff that we're still thinking a lot about. Different things we've done, things I'm not showing you now, that this kind of pattern here, at least in the way the model set up right now, is, uh, is pretty robust in, in general. Um, when then one last thing that I'm just going to stop, this high probability here you know, still translates into a very similar kind of path to present value. Right? So even though that probability looks high, the present value of tariffs, which is you know, what the firms are taking into account when they're making that decision whether to export next period or not, is kind of quite similar uh, across the two, across the two paths. Okay. So I'm going to stop. I've already taken up too much time. Um, I think the, we'll open it up to questions and comments. Um, just unmute yourself and jump in. Can I, let, let me ask a question. I mean, first, let me say that this is pretty fascinating. Uh, and it, in a way it feels like it requires a lot of courage to, try to make sense of all these 50 years where so many things have changed, especially with respect to China. And that's my question, I mean, related to this. So, you know, you have these firms that are solving this optimization problem, trying to take into account of, you know, everything that's going to happen in the subsequent 50 years. But, you know, these firms that solve the initial optimization problem, I mean, they in 1971, they were all state owned. They were presumably, you know, very different from future firms uh, in China. I mean, basically in the way that the, 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 the economic environment changed completely uh, for them, I mean, in, over these years. Is this something that you see as a problem? And, you know, how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, um, so, I see I, so I mean, it's a problem in the sense that we don't know, we don't, we haven't included, right? So anything, so this is good. This is one of the things actually I've been thinking about uh, in other contexts too. The question would be, yeah, what are we loading into uncertainty that, you know, should be something, in some sense, our measure of uncertainty is a little bit like a TFP measure. It's kind of everything else that's not in the model, right? And we say, okay. And so, yeah, uh, some kind of reform. So think about maybe how to model what that would mean to go from, so first, I would need a model of a state-owned enterprise, and I know there are models out there, and those they might be solving a slightly different optimization problem, or they might be facing a different set of constraints, which uh, I would be. And then the question would be, yeah, is there some way we could think about having a model with maybe two types of firms, or, or you know, and then as SOE reform happens, uh, we, send, we we feed that into the model, and then that's going to presumably um, suck some of the some of the stuff out of uh, out of the um, the beliefs, uh, the probabilities, and then into that. Yeah, I mean, I think if we, if anybody's got a good idea of how to do that, I know there are people in the audience who have worked on this kind of stuff. That would be something that we could attempt to uh, to try to account for. Yeah. Let, let me just remind you, Kim, 
respect respect to that that uh, Klaus de Bajon and Tian Shu Chu had a paper in uh, red. They yeah, argued that the the biggest impact on China of the WTO was actually strengthening the reformers' hands to uh, getting rid of uh, to uh, the state-owned enterprises. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so so the, so these things interact too. Yeah, exactly. So if you thought that there was a high probability that you were going to leave the MFN, you'd have less of an incentive to reform and vice versa, oh, right? Yeah, the more important, yeah. the more permanent you thought this was. That's a that's a good, uh, yeah. yeah. Those are both good. But, and, uh, let me mention let me mention one thing, and and you knew that I was going to say something like this. So what was when when China joined joined the WTO? When you look at really disaggregated trade flows, which you're looking at, uh, you're looking at. What were they exporting a lot of? The biggest thing they were exporting were toys. And later they moved away from that. Yeah. China moved into the toy business in the 1990s. And by the end of the 1990s, they like controlled the world toy market. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like all the U.S. brands, you know. the sure, like, Barbie dolls, yeah. You know, yeah. They bought everything from China. Yeah. The partial equilibrium doesn't make it there. Because and, you think that changed wages in China or what? What's, no, uh, what do I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what they did, but the more entry drove the prices down. I mean, China had a huge impact on the world uh, price of uh, so, clothes, uh, toys, and they drove other toy makers out of the market. Tim, what year yes. did you say that started, that phenomenon? That was a Tim, not a Kim. Yes, when I know. Kim, yeah, when, Kim, I'm, I'm telling Tim. I'm t- yeah, what, when did they start buying toys? I don't know. I know by 19, that by uh, 2001, they were more than half of the world toy exports came from China. A, a, a lot of that did start with Playmates. With, and, and it also started when Hasbro went over uh, to uh, get a bid on making G.I. Joes during the Vietnam War. And Hutchison Wampaw won that bid. And uh, a lot of that came out of Hong Kong and Hong Kong toy manufacturers. So that's, that's when a lot of that really took off. Interesting. Yes, I guess the question would be, what would you, you know, in a model, what is that, right? What is changing? Uh, I mean, I guess what you think of it, so, you know, I don't, but I agree with your comment about entry. That not having entry here is um, both. I and mean, one thing for sure, one thing is it's slowing down the uh, the the transition again. Uh, and so yes, I mean, I, that I, I yeah I agree. Um, Steve, can I have a question here? Sure, go ahead. Yes. So now we're thinking now a little bit toys, but uh, would you think you will develop this research into distinguishing the type of industry, say furniture, clothing? Toys. Well, we could, yeah, so, yeah, it's a, so and that's something we could actually do because we have our model right now is mapped exactly to the SITC. And right now, the only difference, I believe, between, uh, between a different SITC codes are their tariff rates. So the question would be, you know, could you change other things? Right? So Tim would say, you know, you want some industries to have, you know, demand growing faster or, or slower, although we have, that's getting soaked up in fixed effects in some sense, but as a modeling thing, would, you know, could you have different, more different kinds of heterogeneity across industries? And I think that is something. So some of you guys have given me hard things to think about, like how to deal with the SOEs and things. To the extent that we could put more heterogeneity across the different goods, that I think is something that we could we could we could feasibly do. So the question of how to structure it and what the important what stuff is. Yeah. Because you might do different regimes and these responses may be different from across the type of product, right? Uh, sorry, if you say that again, I can I couldn't hear you. Because if you distinguish between sectors or type of product, you will get a different type of uh, responses or uh, probability to switching from one regime to the next. Uh, so, you know, the, so the assumption here is that all industries are either NNTR or uh, MFN to the extent that, that there's different heterogeneity of other kinds of things in, uh, in the industries. Yeah, the different industries will react differently than to, uh, to the perceived uh, uncertainty over, over policy. Yeah, that's right.
I mean, they are right now to some extent uh, because the differences in tariffs, because uh, there are differences in tariffs. So some industries are high gap industries and some are low gap industries, but there could be other heterogeneities that we're not, we're not dealing with here right now. Yeah. As an example of that, Kim, I mean, this is nitpicky, but you probably don't want tariffs as being the thing that's relevant for clothing because the multi-fiber agreement lasts until 2005. And if they're in a quota constrained SITC, then it doesn't really matter what the tariff rate is or yeah, well, no, that's, sorry, that's too strong, but it, there's another policy variable on the table that you would want to account for. Yeah. I wouldn't call that nitpicky. I think that's important. I, you know, I, I'll, I'll say I, I caveated earlier on exactly. That's one of the things that we haven't figured out what to do with yet is that there are other kinds of barriers going on uh, and, you know, the Chinese right. relationship particular. Um, but yeah, we, we, we don't have that. But the MFA is helpful because it's observable uh, and other people have written papers about it. So you could steal yeah. their measures. Yeah. John, so, can, so let me just remind I, you guys, sorry. we actually did oh, take sorry. those industries out of the empirical analysis in our baseline results. I oh, the, oh, that's We've right. We've gotten we rid of anything that's, that's right. in the multi-fiber agreement. <laughs> okay, cool. But, gotcha. but just following up on, the, I mean, somewhat related, in, this is about like the earlier thing I was saying about correlated other things that are not the tariffs themselves. I don't think that for you particularly, it's a problem that these that your estimates in the beginning are picking those up because ultimately in the modeling exercise, you only have the tariffs and the tariffs are kind of capturing. I mean, you're trying to, you're trying to look at these two countries over this period of time. So, I mean, the only problem will be taking these numbers and taking them in some other model where there's just tariffs and nothing else and you put them there. But within this framework, I think it's, it's, it's reasonable. I don't I mean. Um, Okay, good. Uh, uh, yeah, I, it's, um, it's, I mean, I just mean it's okay to lower it all on tariffs. I don't, I don't, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, like model. That's what we have. It, yeah. So, no, in a sense, so we've been trying to be careful, you know, about treat, you know, having the model be, you know, uh, line up with what we have in the data so that the, you know, to, to the extent that, you know, these are regressions all have some kind of misspecification. It's the same in the, in the model and the data, but, you know, there's no way to know if that's, if that's for sure true. Um, but yeah, right now it's tariffs. Um, so let me pick up on Kim's point about GE uh, and, and the other point about Hong Kong. You, I assume you excluded Hong Kong from your regressions and- Yeah, numbers. yeah. And I, my understanding is there was some back and forth between Hong Kong and, and the PRC, where a lot of PRC goods that seemed to probably had a lot of value added uh, was were coming through Hong Kong earlier. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how that would you could fit that into your model. It su would suggest maybe some higher elasticity of substitution there. And I, I guess the other sort of bigger data point is. China's, the surge of exports from China was accompanied by a retrenchment of exports from other Asian countries. That would be, at least it makes one curious about how that would fit in to this. Yeah, yep, yeah, I, so that's, yeah, I agree. I mean, that's, this is one of the problems with, uh, with a partial equilibrium approach or even just the two country approach. Um, and yeah, we're, you're, right now we're you know you're always picking and choosing where to where to put in detail and where not. Um, and it, yes, it would be interesting to think about where these where the rest of this this trade was coming from. Um, besides just uh, um, yeah, I mean I guess just yeah, I know yeah yeah, I guess that's in the list of GE things to worry about: entry, substitution from other countries. Um, that's yeah. So, so I will say I mean, we did look at these um, sub China supply factors, um, and and it sort of like shifts up our lines a bit, which which sort of suggests that um, you know it wasn't at, there was some substitution, but it, you know um, it wasn't as much as we we would expect it to be. Where you think that all of a sudden you get access to the U.S. and you stop exporting to Japan and you send everything to the U.S. right away. Um, uh, I think the Hong Kong is a much more delicate thing for us because um, you know we, we've looked at the what's going on with Hong Kong and 
you know, if you basically take everything that, that was going from Hong Kong and add it to China, and sort of treat them as a unified market, then it's some of these elast the elasticities are still low and rising over time, but you know, the gap is, it, they don't rise by as much. But I, I can't imagine everything was going through Hong Kong. Hong Kong was producing stuff themselves as well. So um, yeah, but the, yeah, these are, these are important things to try to figure out. Um, Okay, am I still? <laughs> yeah, uh, so let's see. So I guess whoever was in charge of the recording can turn that, that was off. not me. I hope 